Hi, I'm Annie Fitzsimmons. I'm your Washington Realtors Legal Hotline lawyer. And this is another video in our series on professionalism for the broker who wants to make real estate a career and not just a job. And I am grateful to be joined once more by my friend Camden Schutte. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Camden Schutte with 360 Property Management and Coldwell Banker 360 team on Whidbey Island. So Camden asked me a question a little while ago. The question was, do you remember the question? I think so. Go uh, for it. Yeah, what, I was really curious to hear your thoughts on our changing industry or some changes that might come to our industry, specifically around buyer broker commissions, because uh, it's been in the, in the news and a, and a hot topic lately. Yeah, and his question specifically was, do you think there's gonna come a time when buyers are required to pay the buyer broker compensation? Yep. And the answer that I gave him was, I have no clue right. how this evolves, but it will evolve. And I, I am absolutely certain that we will see short-term changes. By short-term, I mean within the next year, 18 months at least. And I think that we're going to see some longer-term changes within the next five years. And I think that we are going to, and I think some of those changes are going to be substantial. Ultimately, you guys are going to keep doing what you've always been doing, advocating on behalf of sellers as listing brokers, advocating on behalf of buyers as buyer brokers, bringing the two parties together and heading to the closing table. Absolutely. That's not going to change. But what I do think is going to change is how that conversation is shaped between buyer brokers and buyers. Yeah, absolutely. And really, with as much publicity as some of these lawsuits and DOJ investigations and different things happening, it's important for us to communicate. And I think buyer brokers have for, will have now, even now, have forever changed how they communicate about how they get compensated. They should have. I mean, one, one of the focuses of the investigations originally, and I think this was a, initially a DOJ probe, but the, the question that was on the table was, how can buyer brokers represent to buyers my chart, my, my services are free, right? You don't pay anything for my services. And we all know that that's something that at least some buyer brokers have said in the past, and that should be out of the conversation of every buyer broker at this point. If it's not, get it out. Absolutely. Of your conversation. Absolutely. Because Camden, Un unpack that a little bit. It, it, if the buyer is not writing a check for the buyer broker's commission, are the buyer broker's services free to that buyer? And if not, why not? Well, is the buyer broker being compensated? And we all know the answer is yes. And where do those funds come from? Ultimately, regardless of how it's presented, the funds come from the buyer for everyone's compensation. And so to say that you're, compensa you're, you're free to the buyer, it's built into the, what they pay to purchase the home and what the seller is listing their home for in order to net what they want. Right. So buyer is paying the real estate compensation. They're paying it through the purchase price and then the seller takes part of their seller proceeds. Okay, so we're not telling anybody anything they don't already know. Right. The question is buyers how much of that, I'm sorry, brokers, how much of that conversation are you having with your buyers? And I think that's ultimately the only answer to this question I can give you, which yep. the answer is to say, I don't know where we ultimately land, but I know that the path to getting there, wherever it is that we end, wherever this journey ends, I know that the journey involves improved conversation. Absolutely. And you know, the buyer broker agreement is one of the best ways to get that conversation in front of your buyer. Um, you know, I heard in one, a former video, I heard Peely talk about how a client was working with an agent for a long time and then went to an open house and then bought, bought the home and they ran into him and said, hey, are you still looking? Oh, I already bought a house. I didn't know you didn't get compensated if I bought a house. I thought you got like paid an hourly wage or something. What? what better opportunity to have that conversation with your buyer of how you as a buyer broker are compensated regardless of if they pay it directly and our industry goes that way or stays exactly how it is now that's your opportunity to have that conversation and create some loyalty between your buyer and you yeah so form 41a yep. the buyer agency agreement um camden i i couldn't agree with you more the the importance of brokers utilizing the buyer agency agreement with their buyers. It's important now and it's going to increase in importance. Again, I don't know where this journey ends, 
but but one aspect of this journey is going to be improved conversation, yep. meaning transparency between buyer buyer brokers and buyers, and more utilization of that buyer agency agreement. And Camden has touched on one aspect of the buyer agency agreement, and that's education, yep. right? Using that, that buyer agency agreement as a platform to educate your buyer, because buyers don't know how brokers are compensated. They don't understand that if they utilize three months of the buyer broker's time looking at houses and then buy from the listing broker at an open house, that the buyer agent is not going to be compensated. Unless, buyer broker, you've educated your buyer about that issue and you've told them, you've prepared them in advance what to do in that scenario. Yeah. Along with, um, what does the agency mean in that, in that scenario? Buyer, right now, I represent you. I have your highest and best interests, it's, and, and I have a duty of loyalty to you. I'm gonna take no action that's adverse or detrimental to your interests alone, buyer. But if you write an offer with the seller, with the listing broker, at best, you've got a dual agent, which means that that, that that dual agent is basically a conveyor of information. They can't advocate your interest because they can't take, uh, they, they, they have a duty not to, um, take any action that's adverse or detrimental to either interest of, the, of either party in the transaction, meaning they can't advocate for either party. Yeah, not to mention the confidentiality they have to they have to keep for both parties. So right. they can't, can't help you negotiate either. Right. So at best, you've got a dual agent, right? Yep. Worse, you've got no agency because the person who's writing the offer represents the seller. So, so buyer, here's what you need to do in that scenario. And then you give phone numbers and, and email addresses and how are you gonna text me and what if it's late at night or what if it's early in the morning? And you give the agency pamphlet. And you get that buyer agency agreement signed. Absolutely. Right? And you know, we live in a part of the country that's that's leading in some of these conversations. Like I think it was 2009 when we didn't have to put in a buyer broker compensation. In 19, 2019. 2019, thank you. Compensation to get it into the MLS. Well, now that buyer bro that buyer agency agreement came, became important if we needed to negotiate buyer broker compensation, and how is any buyer going to know that again if we don't communicate it with them? So, I I agree with with your take that no matter where it goes, the conversation and the education of our clients, yeah, and, and it needs to start now so we're ahead of it. Yeah, you just reminded me of something. The other thing that that buyer agency agreement does is it helps the buyer to convert their obligation to or their choice to pay compensation to their buyer broker into a, a closing cost. And it's easy, contractually easy, for a buyer to ask a seller to pay the buyer's closing costs. It's not nearly so simple to ask a, a seller to increase their the compensation offered to a selling office or to pay compensation to a selling office if there's no compensation that's negotiated yet. And so buyer brokers, when you have that buyer agency agreement with your buyer, you give their, your buyer the benefit of being able to then say, this obligation that I have to pay compensation to my broker at closing, that's a closing cost. That is now a cost that I have to endure at closing. It's a closing cost. Seller, I'm asking you to pay my closing costs or some portion of my closing costs sufficient to compensate my broker. And that's useful if there's no compensation offered from the seller or if there's less compensation offered from the seller than what your buyer has agreed to pay you. Absolutely. That form is a great opportunity for conversation. Yeah. So brokers, changes are coming. Uh, neither of us can tell you exactly what those changes are gonna be, but I can guarantee you that you are going to need to improve your conversation with buyers around your compensation, increasing the transparency of what it is that you are earning in a transaction. Do you think, Camden, that there might come a time when if a buyer knows how much a buyer broker is earning, they might ask that buyer broker to take less Oh, absolutely. And th that's already something that we're seeing in the fact that it's more transparent being on in IDX feeds and on websites now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Buyer brokers that that could happen. Your buyer broker could your buyer could ask you to take less for their benefit. And then you're going to have to decide whether or not you want to do that. That that's part of that's part of your your negotiation with a buyer about representing them. Yep. And what better time to do that than at the start of the process <laughs> in a buyer agency agreement? At the start of the process, meaning before you spent a bunch of your time, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Anything else we should talk about here? I don't. Th I don't think so. We could. I, I, I'm sorry. Designated brokers 
work with your brokers to understand the importance of the Form 41A and also how to use it. Yeah. Camden, do you guys train in your office how to present the Form 41A to buyers? Absolutely, because it's one of the biggest objections from brokers is, I'm worried my client, my buyer, isn't going to like this. This is going to scare them. So absolutely, we have to work on it. And as designated brokers, we need to be staying on top of the changes that are happening in the industry and potential changes so that we're prepared to educate our brokers and continue to grow our industry. Because we saw coming through 2020, our industry is moving and changing way faster than it ever has. And it's our job to make sure that we're a part of that change and also educating our brokers through it. Yeah, when I have brokers tell me that they are hesitant to use the Form 41A because they feel resistance from their buyer, what if they're not gonna sign it? I always flip it around and say, when you're, when you're representing a seller, do you have the seller agree to pay you? Well, yeah. Do you have them sign a listing agreement saying they're gonna pay you? Well, yeah. Do you feel this tension or this awkwardness around asking a seller to sign an agreement that they're gonna pay you? Well, no. And why not? Right. Because everybody does that, right? And it's what we've always done. Yep. And so buyer broker or buyer or I'm sorry, brokers and designated brokers, use of the buyer agency agreement has got to become so commonplace for brokers that brokers you can use it just like you would use a listing agreement. Absolutely, and that only comes through using it. Only through practice, I agreed. Yeah. If you have questions on this topic or any other, send an email to me, legalhotline at warealtor.org. Thank you for being a Washington Realtors member.